Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be sitting here with Dr. Walter Longo, who's a professor of gerontology and biological sciences at the University of Southern California. He's also director of the Longevity Institute. Dr. Longo has made huge contributions to the field of aging. He has made uh, significant contributions looking at the effects of fasting and other diets um, in the role of human aging and lifespan and biomarkers of, of health span, as well as looking at other metabolic fasting therapies for the treatment of human diseases. So, Walter, um, on the podcast, we've talked a lot about time-restricted eating from uh, Dr. Sachin Panda's work and mm -hmm. how what the effects are of eating within a certain time frame, like a 12-hour, at least a 12-hour time window that's in uh, that corresponds with a circadian rhythm, and how that's really important for a variety of different um, metabolic factors because our metabolism is on a circadian rhythm, but also looking at the effects of having a longer fasting period when we're resting. Um, so maybe you can tell us, you've done a significant amount of research on fasting in animals and humans. Yes, yes. So we um, are very interested in, in aging and really uh, what are the interventions that extend longevity in a safe way. And, um, and fasting, uh, periodic fasting or better yet, fasting mimicking diets. So these diets that are designed to sort of trick the system and make it think it's fasting when you're not fasting. So that's what we focus on. And the idea really came from uh, trying to substitute the calorie restriction, these interventions which require that people are restricted from calories uh, permanently, essentially. And we, I always thought, uh, I was a student of Roy Walford who was one of the pioneers of, of color restriction uh, back in the early 90s. And I, um, in fact, I, I was there when uh, they went into Biosphere 2, which was this uh, uh, bubble essentially in Arizona where they did the first human study on, on color restriction. And, uh, and the group, when they came out, it was a very stressed out group, uh, very thin, right? So, so from then, uh, we wanted, I wanted to come up with something that was really for everybody, right? So how can you uh, take that have something as powerful, but that everybody can do, and that's where this fasting mimicking diet uh, came about. And really, about uh, you know anywhere from four to one week or longer of this change into these diets, which is uh, usually low in protein, low in sugar, um, and high in, in good fats. And is that sort of um, so? It's low. Low. We're kind of talking about this fasting mimetic diet, but but uh, the fasting itself is also something. So there's the fasting mimetic diet, which You've done a lot of research on um, in, in animals and also humans, but the fasting itself is different from caloric restric restriction, right? There's a lot of overlap between looking at the effects of different biomarkers for uh, health span, but there's also some differences, right? Well, it's very different, right? I mean, calorie calorie restriction is let's say 20 to 30 percent restriction in calories, so you're basically eating all the time and and you just happen to eat less calories. Um, fasting um, and periodic fasting are, are much more extreme and we really use them to uh, tr uh, trick or manipulate the system, orchestrate a lot of genes to get it to do um, things like increase protection a lot or turn on stem cells. And so you can't, a lot of these things you can't get by color restriction, uh, but you can get them by, uh, by these more extreme uh, interventions. And um, um, yeah, so um, uh, calorie restriction also is missing the biggest component of the periodic fasting, which is not fasting itself, but it's refeeding, right? So most people think of the restriction as what's working, but it turns out, as we've shown in a number of papers, that is the refeeding that is doing most of the work, right? So that during the, for example, when, when we, when we uh, publish on regeneration, the stem cells are turned on during uh, fasting, but it is the refeeding that causes the rebuilding of the system. And so the most important part is the refeeding. And in calorie restriction, of course, you never have that. Uh, so, so it's really uh, interesting how, uh, how this works, and it's, it's a very coordinated uh, effect uh, based on cycles of fasting and refeeding. Um, you mentioned the, the regeneration of the stem cells, so that's the study that you're referring to. Um, you did this prolonged fasting for, I think it was like 48 to 72 hours in, in animals, and you showed that during that fasting state, the white blood cells were, were uh, clear. They were basically, their populations decreased. And the reason they had decreased was because 
something was being activated called autophagy, which is the clearing away of damaged cells. And um, somehow, the, so the autophagy that happened, um, you're saying that after that occurred, that was the signal for the regeneration of the stem cells or yeah, the repeating uh, after? Um, autophagy is uh, clearly occurring. This is established for fasting. Uh, but we don't think, um, I mean, what we've done so far was, now we're focusing more on autophagy, but what we've done so far, it was more about um, if you have a, uh, an immune system, a complete immune system, that immune system has a lot of cells that you don't really need, right? Mm -hmm. So during starvation, whether you're a mouse, and now we know the, the same to be true for people, the, you have to get rid of a lot of cells, a lot of things that you don't need. Um, and that's what's happening. It's not so much about autophagy, but it's more about apoptosis. And so a program cell that you're killing, essentially getting rid of a lot of cells. And then you stand by, you wait until food comes around again, and you rebuild it. So, for example, in a mouse, about 40% of the uh, white blood cells are destroyed during this period of, of four days of fasting or so. And then that 40% is rebuilt within a few days of refeeding, right? So it's really extraordinary um, and probably the most powerful uh, regeneration or generation program that you have since um, birth, essentially, right? So uh, when, we, when, when a baby is first born, of course, you're generating all these systems. But then and that never happens again, right? Not in that way. Like, for example, the liver being generated and the lungs being generated and the heart, etc. So fasting is probably the most powerful, at least that, that we could think of, um, the most powerful way, particularly if it's prolonged, to shrink a system, let's say, make the liver a lot smaller, make all these organs a lot smaller, the immune system, and then regenerate it, right? And, and so this is why we think it's so powerful, because it's, it's not really the fasting that is doing anything, it's the body that is doing everything. Uh, the fasting just tells the body, I need you to kill all the cells, and then the refeeding gives the message, I need to... I need you to rebuild all mm -hmm. these systems. This seems like it has, I mean, implications for uh, human aging because, you know, if you're, if you're talking about humans as we age, we, um, something occurs called immunosenescence where we start to lose some of our, you know, we don't, we don't make as many um, lymphocytes, actually. It's the lymphoid population that decreases with age. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're able to then be able to um, activate these hematopoietic stem cells to regenerate, you know, the, the blood cell population. That seems like it would have implications for aging. But also I thought you found something very interesting in that paper, and that was what we talked about with the regenerating the stomatic, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, which also increased in cell number, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you also did this experiment in older mice, and you showed something very interesting, I thought, because as we age, um, the immunosenescence seems to be happening and I may be I'm doing a, whole, a huge oversimplification here, but it seems to be happening in the lymphoid uh, cells, which are mostly B and T, T cells, um, as opposed to the other blood cells we have, the myeloid lineages, which are composed of neutrophils, macrophages, platelets, um, things like monocytes. Uh, so, so as we age, we have more of those types of immune cells and less mm -hmm. the other. But you actually found that if you fasted those animals, something happened with that population, correct? Yeah, so we found that, uh, that the lymphocytes number uh, goes back to the more youthful level, and the ratio of myeloid cells to lymphocytes goes also back not to the, the, the same level as during youth, but certainly it moves in that direction. And, and so the profile of the immune system is much more uh, similar to the, to the young one. So essentially, we see rejuvenation of the system. See, that was really cool for me when I was reading that because I started thinking about, you know, not only with the immunosenescence, how that seems relevant because when you're older, you become, you know, more susceptible to infections, um, cancer, obviously your immune cells are play, you know, the first line of defense against killing cancer cells. But the other thing I thought about that was very interesting, and I'm not sure if you've, you've probably read this paper, but it came out of Japan. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I don't remember the group, but they were looking at a variety of different biomarkers in uh, the elderly population, in centenarians, in semi-supercentenarians, and in supercentenarians. And they looked at 
all sorts of uh, biomarkers that are related to aging. So they looked at telomere length, they looked at senescence, immunosenescence, they looked at all sorts of inflammatory biomarkers. Uh, they looked at metabolic, you know, metabolic markers, glucose regulation, you know, insulin sensitivity, they looked at kidney function, you know, the whole, pa just tons of different biomarkers. And they were trying to find which biomarkers were consistent um, with healthy aging in all populations. So not just, you know, to make it to centenarians, but to make it to every single age group. And what was identified was the only biomarker that was consistent with all the age groups was um, inflammation. So lower inflammation was predictive of vitality um, and cognitive function. And it was considered to be the only thing that was driving the aging process or that could predict mortality aside from age itself. And, and I was thinking about how monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, these are the parts of the immune system that are um, the myeloid lineage, which is, you know, uh, we have more of them when we're older, they actually produce a lot of really nasty chemicals, hypochlorite, um, hydrogen peroxide. So the, the myeloid lineage is pr producing lots of nasty inflammatory chemicals. So it'd be mm. kind of interesting to look and see. I mean, I'm totally just speculating here, but yeah. if there's some way, if you were to make a, if you could regenerate the immune system to, to resemble more of a youthful phenotype, first of all, it'd be interesting to look at centenarians to see if they have more, more balanced, right? If they have more of an immune system that has more lymphoid and myeloid, so it's not so asymmetric. Um, that would be interesting to see, but also whether or not, if that plays a role in uh, healthy aging. Yeah, I think we, we need to be careful with the uh, inflammation and the, as, a, as a cause of aging. Um, I see it the other way around. I see it as the aging is the cause of inflammation. Uh, and that's, that makes sense, right? Because inflammation is, is really uh, can come from dysregulation of, of uh, immune cells and other, and other uh, cells in, in the body. So, um, yeah, so I think it's... Um, um, really, the evidence that inflammation is the driving the driver is not there. There's very few studies actually showing that uh, you know by, by increasing a little bit of inflammation, increasing aging, they're, they're, they're not there. Uh, it, it's possible, but this doesn't seem likely. You know, I look at it as much more in in, in the sense of uh, program, meaning that all organisms have a program, and this program is there to keep them uh, healthy and, and young. Uh, up to a certain uh, point, and now there there are ways to make these programs longer or shorter, and um, and I think the centenarian just happen to have uh, programs that are stronger and longer, and uh, and then when these programs fail, the inflammation is one of the things that, that you see um, as much as well, and it happens together with a lot of other problems, um, but um, certainly uh, inflammation, um, I mean. It's a mark as a marker is a very important one. So if you look at C-reactive protein, for example, or interleukin six, um, in an intervention that you do, you want to see them coming down, and this is an, a good indication, uh, as we've done for our uh, fasting mimicking diet, where we show that almost every patient, that I mean, we showed a, a decrease in inflammation in the mice that were given the fasting mimicking diet, mimicking diet started in, at middle age, but we also saw it in the population, in the human population, age 20 to 70, where everybody that had high C-reactive protein came down, back down after three cycles of the FMD, came back, back down to their normal levels. So, um, but again, that's probably indicating that the systems were not working properly, and now you're bringing them back to, to a, uh, you know, so maybe you're regenerating uh, part of the, the, um, uh, the, you know, bone marrow, and, and uh, maybe also you kill some bad cells in the spleen, et cetera, et cetera. And so the result of that is the less inflammatory mm -hmm, markers mm -hmm. uh, that are being released. The liver also, we've shown that it undergoes cycles of, of uh, um, you know, atrophy and, and regeneration. So all of these organs are contributing to inflammation. And so, um, and so it, it, it's, uh, it's important that with an intervention, you see also an effect in, an inflammation because it tells you that, that the intervention is working, the system is being reset back to a more youthful state. Yeah, I do agree that, that, that that's definitely a good marker. Um, so you were talking about this fasting mimetic diet in humans, this, this clinical study in humans that you had, or pilot trial that you had done in humans, uh, where you're, is there, so 
with the with the mouse studies and the fasting and the autophagy and the regenerating of the stem cells and you know that stuff's all very exciting and has relevance for you know for cancer and for aging in general. But um, how can you translate like a forty eight hour fast to humans? And is that sort of why you've come up with this fasting mimetic diet? Because the the amount of time would have to be like a week or five days or something that seems a lot more difficult for humans to do. Um, yeah, so it's not just about difficulty, it's also about safety. Um, and, and so when we first started with the, with the fasting uh, in, in cancer patients, uh, basically the patients didn't want to do it and the doctors didn't want to do it. Uh, so it's, it's really a struggle and it took us forever here at the, at the Norris Cancer Center, our own university, to get uh, 18 patients to go through it. It took us like five or six years. Um, so it, it, it was very difficult. And then we started asking people, what if we gave you a fasting making diet? And we started asking doctors, what if we gave uh, patients a, a box and it has all the, um, all the foods that they need? Uh, so it's more of a medicine, right? You just hand over to the patient a medicine. And then everything turned around. So people were much more likely to do it. They, they, they felt like more psychologically, we give them something. They also, of course, they're eating almost normally. I mean, normally in the sense at the right times. They're not eating normally. Obviously, the diet is very different than, than the normal diet. And the doctors felt, felt good about it. So I think it was really important to get, um, to get the fasting mimicking diet going. And, uh, you know, so now we have a number of trials. Uh, both in cancer patients, in diabetes patients. Soon enough, we'll start with, uh, well, we finish uh, one in multiple sclerosis. Um, and um, so now we're ready to start talking to the FDA about moving to the next level. Um, I think people are underestimating the power of this. And uh, that's good uh, and bad, I guess. But, um, um, but uh, I think that um, it's got real potential um, as we're seeing now that we're uh, um, talking to doctors. And they, now we're seeing a lot of doctors, cardiologists, endocrinologists, gynecologists. Um, and uh, prescribing it, right, uh, or recommending it. They're not prescribing it, it's not a drug, but they're recommending it to patients, and, and I, 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 it's been great. Um, you know, now we have a couple hundred doctors that we're talking to, but uh, to see this, uh, this group of people um, uh, change from this drug-centered mentality to maybe uh, there are things that, um, that we didn't realize could be very powerful and, and much more um, able to, again, let the body fix itself. Um, and so I would not be surprised if in 10 years uh, worldwide these type of uh, interventions uh, are going to be standard in the, in the doctor's office. Wow, that's really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's really diet, lifestyle, they play a really big role in, in cancer. I mean, it's, it's pretty well known that Things like obesity, smoking, you know, they, being sedentary, they all increase the, the, the chance of getting cancer. Uh, and, you know, these people are getting cancer more and more these days. I know that um, it's the second leading cause of death in the United States. And I think actually recently, according to the newest CDC data, the state of California, it's the leading cause of death. Um, it, it trumped a heart disease in, in the state of California. Right. So In Europe, is the same way in a lot of places. In Europe? It's number one. Really? Um, People smoke a lot in Europe, but uh, you know the, the the cancer treatments, the standard of care, you know, chemo, chemotherapy, radiation, surgical, you know, interventions have sort of been the same for quite some time, several decades at least. So I can't think of a better time than now for these metabolic types of interventions to make their way, hopefully, into standard care, either with standard care or possibly replacing it to some degree in the future. Uh, yeah. But but you did a clinical trial, so or you were involved in a cl this clinical trial that you kind of mentioned like briefly, uh, which I thought was very interesting in it, the, the actual one with fasting, where the, the cancer patients fasted either before or after the chemo treatment. And I thought it was very interesting that you found, maybe you can talk about it, but you found that their, uh, their normal cells were more resistant to the stresses of chemo, whereas the cancer cells were more sensitized to that. Right, right. So of course, all of this starts in mice, and, uh, and in mice we were able to show very strong effects, what we call differential stress resistance, which is you protect the normal cells, but not the cancer cells, and then something called differential stress sensitization, 
where you kill the cancer cells, but not the normal cells. Can you explain that a little bit, like wh why that is? Yeah, well, th that is, uh, again, because the, almost every organism, you can start with E. coli, actually, bacteria, and then move to simple organisms like yeast and all the way up to, to mice, they have starvation responses, right? So if you starve uh, any system, virtually any system, they'll go into this shield the mode, protect the mode, and then they sit there until food comes around again. So in this protective mode, they're very resistant to all kinds of things. They're resistant probably because they have to be resistant to the sun and to chemicals produced by other uh, uh, microorganisms that might be surrounding them. And um, so then um, they happen to also, at least uh, mice and now we think humans, uh, chemotherapy is also uh, one of the, um, the toxins that they're resistant to. So you starve them, the normal cells go into the protective mode. When you starve a cancer cell, though, because the oncogenes um, are the regula regulatory genes of this protection, uh, cancer cells, by definition, can never respond, right? So they're just normal cells respond no matter what normal cell it is, from a, um, a muscle cell to a, a hepatocytes to a brain cell, and, uh, but the cancer cells don't respond. Um, and that's really the, what's called differential stress resistance. In the differential stress sensitization instead, it really has to do with um, something that I think was underappreciated, which is a cancer cell is, is viewed as a smart cell. In fact, the cancer cell is a very dumb cell. And, and why is it dumb? Because it is evolved in all this uh, high nourishment environment, right? So it's evolved with a lot of proteins, a lot of amino acids, a lot of sugars, a lot of growth factors. All these things are around all the time. So by uh, making them available, um, I know that oncologists mean well, right? But by making all this available during chemotherapy, you're really helping one thing more than anything else is the cancers, right? What you're referring to is them telling people to eat a lot of calories. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, so they tell, they tell me. And, and so, uh, you know, because the, ca the cancer loves sugar, uh, it loves amino acids, right? And depends on sugar and amino acids. You, the more you give it, the, the happier it is. And, um, and so, uh, and also uh, these nutrients uh, basically, um, you know, make the normal cells um, sensitive, right? So you're making the normal cells sensitive and you're making the cancer happy, right? Instead of the opposite, right. which is make, make the normal cells protected and make the cancer cells miserable. Why are the cancer cells miserable? Well, because again, having evolved in this abundance, once you take the abundance away, it, it's like almost saying, imagine somebody that had a very low IQ, uh, you know, be looking for food, you know, and, and if, if you make it available, uh, it's easy. Let's say, let's, thinking about a monkey, let's say a monkey that has got very low IQ, and, and, and you, uh, you, know, you put it in front of food all around it, and it's gonna have no problem, right? As soon as you take the same monkey with a very low IQ and you make it extremely difficult to find the food, um, now that, that monkey is going to have a problem. And, um, you know, and that's how we see the cancer cells. You know, once uh, the amino acids are low, the growth factors and the sugar are low, the cancer is going to struggle. And then if on top of that you hit it with chemotherapy, uh, it just has a very low chance of escaping. This is why in mice we see uh, cancer-free survival, meaning that mice are free of cancer only when we combine the starvation or the fasting mimicking diets with, uh, with the chemotherapy. We almost never see it when we use each one alone, right? Mm -hmm. We and many other labs have tried that. You, you see, which is great, often the fasting or the fasting mimicking diets are as good as chemo, but you never see uh, the, you know, the alone, each intervention alone being curative. So it's very interesting. And this is also very important to point out because a lot of people tend to either be in the camp of traditional medicine or in the camp of alternative medicine. And, and people don't understand that. Uh, you know, both of them are very important. And, and, and when you combine it, particularly the alternative integrative medicine that's got a deep scientific foundation, when you combine it, now you have a very powerful system you know, in your hands. And, um, uh, you know, whereas each alone doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, so it's what it, it's kind of like what you're explaining, to, at least the way I'm understanding it, um, is that you need, so that the fasting itself is a stressor, but you need another stressor because the stress plus the stress is what can push the cancer cells to the death, right? So they're, in a way... Yeah, I don't you, see it, uh, I mean, I, I don't really uh, see it as a stress. Um, fasting? Yeah, I really don't see it as a stress. I see it more as a, as a, an environment that um, is, is very common, right? Um, it's very common to bacteria. It's, 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 it's more common, in fact, than food, right? So you can see food is a bigger stress than fasting, right? Uh, because food really puts you in a weak position, right? And, and, and the fasting puts you in a strong position. So if you look at most organisms on the planet, they're much more under starvation condition than they are, including humans, right? Like historically, uh, if you look at, uh, there's some really b nice books about, uh, you know, the last, uh, the medieval times in Italy and even after. And, and it was, it's amazing how many times they were without food at all, right? Mm -hmm. They could yeah, be yeah. without food for months. And this was very, very common for everybody. Imagine before then, you know, imagine tens of thousands of years ago, we must have gone without food for, for, for really long time. So, so, so fasting is part of the normal world. It is the normal world. And food comes around once in a while, and then you go back to, to, to fasting. But uh, you have to respond to that, and you respond by having a, you know, entering a mode of survival that is very different from the one that you enter or you stay in when you have plenty of food around. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I think the, what I, what I kind of was trying to convey was that it's, it activates stress response pathways because, you know, even though it is part of our normal, you know, obviously throughout human evolution, we've been through periods of time with, you know, no food and starvation. Mm -hmm. That is normal. It is part of our normal, you know, it's, it, it is part of our normal uh, biology, I guess. But yeah. I think that because it activates all these stress response pathways in yeah, a way. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, worldwide, technically, yeah, it is, it is a stress. I mean, it's viewed as a stress, but, but I guess that's... Like a hormetic type of stress is what I'm talking about. Yeah, but, but that's the one that I, I have a problem with, meaning mm -hmm. that the hormetic stress is really a, um, a, uh, a, you know, something that you activate by having a, a, um, uh, some type of damage or problem that activates a response, and then that response makes the, the system more Stronger. protected against yeah. the, the, the bigger problem, right? And, um, but here I view it more as um, program A, program B type of thing, right? So program A, the major program, is the starvation program where you are in a shielded mode, right? Your decision is let's be in a long-term uh, protected mode. And program B is when you say, uh, when the organism makes the decision that it doesn't need to be in a protective mode because it really wants to focus on reproduction, on growth and reproduction. So I think it's better to view it this way because I think a lot of people, um, by going into the hormesis uh, theory, uh, maybe miss a little bit of the point. And I know a lot of people that, uh, would disagree with me on this, but. But really, by doing the work in, in, like we've done in E. coli, in yeast, in human cells, in mice, any humans, you start getting you know, a, a more clear picture of what's going on. And I really see it as, as a, um, A and B, um, you know, the environment decides w which program you, you, you adopt. Hmm. That's an interesting, interesting way to think about it. Um, I, getting back to the cancer with the fasting and this kind of, we got sidetracked, but the 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 fasting the cancer cells itself so doing this in animals and also you've been involved with a in a clinical trial where it uh, it was shown to lower you know markers of damage in in human blood cells DNA damage was lower but the cancer cells were more sensitized to death um, in animal studies you showed that the uh, because of the fasting lowers glucose levels and glu like you mentioned cancer cells love glucose, that's called the Warburg effect, where they're predominantly using glucose. Of course, they also use glutamine and amino acids. Um, but I thought it was also you know, it, very interesting because I've often thought about cancer cells as being primed to die. You mentioned how oncogenic signaling is all screwing up all sorts of, th they're damaged, they're messed up cells, they're not normal. And they have high levels of you know, pro or pro-apoptotic proteins that are causing them, they're supposed to cause them to die, but they've countered that with the anti-apoptotics. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and all it really, so it's almost like they're primed to die, but they need that just extra stress, whether that's from chemo or possibly from activating mitochondria, um, which are the largest producers of reactive oxygen species. So do you think that part of the, the fasting of the cancer cells and sort of uh, causing them to then use fatty acids, which can only be used by the mitochondria to generate energy, yeah. um, as a byproduct then making reactive oxygen species, do you think that's part of... Um, the killing, I mean, in addition to the immune system, which you also showed. Yeah, I think system. it's all connected. You know, I think it's all connected. So, yes, yes, we published a paper uh, calling it the, the fast independent anti Warburg effect. Mm -hmm. And so, basically, the um, normally you know, the, the cancer cells can rely on glucose. And once the glucose is lower, they have no choice but to try to go back to oxidative phosphorylation and using the mitochondria uh, to get energy because there is no other way around mm -hmm. it, right? And, um, and that's great because uh, then um, that is, uh, they become desperate essentially, and that, um, that condition uh, makes them undergo suicide. Because now, like you said, you, know, you produce a lot of free radicals, and, uh, but the cell is not set up to be protected. Uh, so it's a very bad combination. And, um, and this uh, leads to, we believe, leads to the extensive death, and then in mice can cause cancer free survival. But also we think that probably that is involved in allowing the immune cells to move in and, and uh, uh, kill them. Uh, or it allows the cells to become more uh, immunogenic so that now they're easier to be recognized by dendritic cell, et cetera, and, um, and to be set up to cause an immune response uh, than normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you actually showed um, the, that the Maybe it was the fasting mimetic diet itself was, was able to increase cytotoxic T lymphocyte number, which are and play an important role in killing cancer cells. Yeah, not just increase the number, which that is very much consistent with our older paper, but more so making the cancer cells um, exposed to it. Right, so it was, it was wow. it's more about making the cancer cell um, more unable, like you were saying, now, the, the, normally the cancer cell figures out how to deal with the immune system and says, and has mm -hmm. proteins that say, I'm one of yours, mm -hmm. right? And, and tricks the immune system in that sense. And so the fasting uh, takes that away. And, um, and this is really, again, uh, interesting because it is this coordinated uh, multi-level uh, approach that the fasting is causing, which makes you think, again, that some of these um, programs some of these effects may have been evolved effects to get rid of, let's say, of precancer cells, right? Because right. fasting was something that was normal for human beings, kind of like sleep. Um, and then and maybe it was utilized to, for protection. And then eventually when we stopped doing it, we lost this, uh, we lost this feature. We lost this uh, help that the fasting had always given us. And maybe uh, that also caused us to be uh, now you know, exposed to this uh, very high incidence of, of, of diseases that we, um, we earlier did not have. You know. Do you practice fasting yourself? Do you? Yes, of course, I practice, I practice fasting. I, um, I don't uh, normally eat lunch, uh, but I also I just wrote a, uh, finished a book um, which was published in Italy, and it's going to follow uh, here in, uh, in the U.S., and in it, I, I talk about the, um, the need to use this in, in a flexible way, right? And, and this is going to have to be the future of nutrition. And I think nutritionists and the dietitians and doctors are going to have to get used to this. Um, so, the, for example, I say if you're overweight or obese or, or you tend to gain weight, then you have to go to this two meal a day program, like breakfast and lunch or breakfast and dinner, okay? As I did for, for 15 years. Uh, then if you underweight, though, you can't do that anymore. So you have to go back to three meals a day, right? So you, you have to use fasting and time-restricted feeding, mm -hmm. and such in Panda's work, which I also utilize uh, for that purpose, you know? And, and so keep the, the feeding to 12 hours or less, and then decide the meal frequency. And Sachin and I just wrote a, an article on this and, uh, uh, to, to uh, control the weight. It's really important, particularly control you know, visceral control fat. fat. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we hope that that's what doctors start doing and say, instead of uh, give simple solution, because uh, two meals a day may not be easy to follow. 
but it's a clear rule, right? And that's what people need. You can say, I, I go for it or I don't, but if I do go for it, it's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas now we have a system where it's almost impossible for anybody to regulate. When you tell somebody eat five or six times a day, it's almost impossible to uh, uh, regulate what somebody eats, right? Um, by by bring, making it two meals a day, um, then you have a much higher control and, uh, and that can serve to, in time restriction and two meals a day, they can serve to, uh, um, you know, uh, regulate the amount of calories as such and as shown for the time restriction. Um, and uh, so now we, you know, we need to do more studies on, on meal frequency, but, but of course, uh, this is likely to get the same uh, similar effects. Do you think it's more important, so within, if you're eating within this 12-hour window, which is coordinated with the circadian rhythm, then, and if you're eating two meals, do you think it, that you'd get more benefits if you had the two meals closer together because then you, in theory, would be fasting for longer, you'd have, you know, more beta-hydroxybutyrate, ketone bodies, things that are, you know, you know, being produced upon a prolonged fasting, or, or do you think uh, it I would say, I would say, you know, I spend you know, 20, almost 25 years uh, since the Walford days. Um, and I would say I learned one thing, and also being Italian and spending a lot of time around the world, I learned that you cannot take happiness away from people, you know. So I always stayed away from trying to, to regulate too much, mm -hmm. you know, too close, mm -hmm. uh, two hours apart, you know, what do you got to eat? You know? So I think we, we always start with, how can we keep you as close as possible to what makes you happy uh, while optimizing uh, the, the longevity aspect? Um, so I never started doing that because I know that people are not going to do it, just like calorie restriction. Calorie restriction has been around for 100 years, and nobody does it, right? I mean, maybe one in a 1,000. I'd be surprised if it's even that, right? Yeah. Maybe one in 10,000, right? So after 100 years of calorie restriction research, one in 10,000 Americans maybe are doing calorie restriction. Um, so, so I think that it's important, you know, for example, with the two meals a day, there's a lot of people that have done that on their own, right? There's a lot of centenarians. If you go to Loma Linda or you go to Okinawa or you go to Southern Italy, a lot of people say, yeah, I eat twice a day. That's okay. And so, so that told me that from the beginning that there was something that, that was doable and people even doing it uh, in a voluntary, voluntary way. Um, in, in anything else, to start regulating, you know, you should eat uh, four. And also 12 hours, I, I think a lot of people did that kind of time restriction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's when I grew up, that's how we did it. You know, you ate, maybe at breakfast at 8 a.m. and then 8, 8.30 at the most, you finished, you know, and that was it. And um, so, yeah, so I think that, that that's important to, to uh, not try to push for every inch of the longevity plan and, and really, because people will abandon it. That's another thing we show up, you know. If you tell them to do things that, that are very much, uh, you know, not in tune with what they're used to, they'll do it for six months and then, and then they'll never do it again. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, this is why the, um, the uh, skipping meals, because a lot of people do it. And when they, you switch to it, that's just an easy thing to do and you can do it all the rest of your life. And then the periodic uh, fasting mimicking diets, because also, it's not very invasive, and people say, yeah, you know, every three or four months, I'll, I'll, I'll give you five days like that. You know, make it simple for me. Don't make me, you know, don't make it too low calorie. Make me eat, but I can do it. So I think it's, uh, if we want the masses to do it, it has to be the technology and the safety, et cetera, et cetera, it has to match their needs. Um, and I think that, that that's where the effort should be put in, you know, uh, rather than trying to, to you know, regulate everything. You know how right. people do everything. Right. Yeah, and, and compliance is very important. Um, you know, so do you the the doing eating eating within a certain time frame and eating two meals a day actually is what what I do. I, I eat. I usually try to eat within a ten hour, yeah. uh, and I fast for about you know fourteen hours. But I'm really interested in um, the autophagy benefits and in the stem cell you know, being able to, to make more hematopoietic stem cells. And I'm wondering what a human would have to do to, to get, the, like, is my 14 hours of fast every night doing that? Or do I have to do a four day prolonged fast, which I can't, I mean, I wouldn't do that, like, unless I had some sort of supervision or possibly this fasting mimetic diet, which you mentioned, 
you've shown in several different studies in many different ways mimics fasting, and it's this low sugar, low protein, high fat diet. So, um, you know, is that something that? Yeah, I think um, there there are different advantages. I mean, there is obviously some overlap. So I would say. If you're on the perfect diet, which is a vegan pescatarian diet, low protein, high nourishment, and then like I like to, I do all this, like two meals a day, twelve hour restriction, which and then the the rest that I just said, if you're on that, you're not gonna need as many fasting mimicking diets, right? Um, but the fasting mimicking diet uh, uh, um, uh, pushes you into a, a mode that you don't normally get be, uh, with all these interventions. Why? Because overnight. You most of the 14 hours you got some glycogen uh, to burn, right? So, so you're not really needing to do much of a switch to anything else, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Uh, and and that's and I think it's good. You know, shouldn't go over that um, because it's just a continuous thing. You know, you don't want to push the system too much into these uh, extreme modes all the time. It's different from the fasting making diet because, as I said, you know, the fasting making diet really. Uh, by day two of the diet, and only by day two or so of the diet, the system starts switching to a ketogenic mode. You start burning visceral fat as your major source of energy. Your brain starts moving from burning sugar to burning ketone bodies, you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, so, as I said, everything starts shrinking. The immune system starts shrinking. The, the liver, the heart, the, the, even the oligodendrocytes, as we've shown in our multiple sclerosis paper. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that you're not going to get with anything else. Uh, and you're only going to get it with, um, with uh, this prolonged uh, fasting making diet. Uh, now, is it possible that if you did uh, some of these things many, many times, that this would be equivalent uh, to a fasting making diet? Yes, possible. But again, uh, we've seen that uh, we don't know, you know, because theoretically there shouldn't be enough because you're never going to get to to this shrinking uh, and, re and, and rebuilding. But uh, uh, even if it was like that, then I think that um, it'd be, it, it, again, it's hard to change people's behavior all the time. So we, we, we felt that um, by doing these periodic interventions, is, we got a much better chance of, of getting there. You mentioned the multiple sclerosis with your fasting mimetic diet and also the fact that this diet sort of shifts you to a more uh, fat burning state, which is sort of in line with, um, well, it's definitely in line with ketosis, which you can get from fasting, but also in line with people that are doing a more ketogenic type of diet. And in your clinical study with people with multiple sclerosis, or was it in the mouse study, one of the studies you had... I think it was the, the human study. You want to talk about that? You had a ketogenic diet. You had the fasting mimetic diet. Yeah, we did the same in mice and human, right? So, so it was um, a fasting mimicking diet and ketogenic diet in both cases. And, um, and in, in the mice, of course, we could demonstrate some things and, and these very clear effects, which was uh, the, um, the fasting mimicking diet causes the white blood cells, so the immune cells, as I mentioned earlier, to be destroyed, partially destroyed. And... Uh, and then it turns on the stem cells, and when you make new cells, of course, they're no longer autoimmune, right? So the original cells are autoimmune, they're atta attacking the oligodendrocytes in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. The new cells, we've shown they're no longer immune. And, uh, and this leads to about 20% of the mice being disease-free, right? So meaning 20% of the mice are cured from, from this um, uh, autoimmunity, which is very much like multiple sclerosis. And, um, the other thing that happens is that the oligodendrocytes, with the inflammation, goes down, right? So, meaning the general uh, inflammatory state around the spinal cord, particularly, uh, goes down. And so, this is very important because it allows the, the progenitor cells, so the ones that give rise to new myelin, so mm -hmm. they rebuild the spinal cord, uh, they can now do their job and regenerate. The system. So now, again, you have, as I mentioned earlier, for cancer, you have this coordinated effect, which, which you you take the bad cells, replace them with the new cells, and then block the inflammation, rebuild the spinal cord. Now you can say, "Well, this is incredible. This is right. magic, right?" <laughs> well, again, it's not. It's just that the body has to have this ability. Like you cut yourself, the system that goes to work is incredible, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, so it's like saying, you know, if I found a way to 
I regenerate part of my arm by fooling the system into thinking that it just got cut everywhere, mm -hmm. right? That's, if you want to see fasting, uh, you can see it like that. And that's why it looks so magic is because um, it, uh, it is an evolved process that has been, you know, been evolving for billions of years. And so it knows exactly what to do to fix a series of problems. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you can see the, the, the wound uh, yeah. as, a, as a, you know, in the spinal cord, as you will see, as a cut, uh, uh, you would think of as the cut of, in the skin. Um, so yeah. I wonder, I, I had this thought I want to say, but also you showed improve, the p people with multiple sclerosis had improvements as according to some tests or something as well, right? Yeah. With the fasting mimetic diet and also the ketogenic diet, which... Yeah, and also the ketogenic. Less so with the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. um, and um, and this is Marcus Bock in Berlin that was the the lead person in the study. Um, and but I mean the amazing thing is that a week of fasting followed by by Mediterranean diet, which is really a regular diet, uh, did better than six months of ketogenic diet. Right. Oh wow. So continuous, right? Okay. And, oh, okay. Uh, and and that's what makes it very impressive. So wait, it was one week of fasting mimetic diet. One and single then time, right? Yeah. Five days, and then twenty five. Seven days. days. Of, yeah. Seven days. And seven then the rest days, of and then and then the rest of the six months, I'm a regular Mediterranean diet. With oh, much the, really? Just one. Yeah. Wow, that is. This, is, this is what makes it remarkable, you know. So now we're we're approaching the FDA, and uh, I think we're going to propose uh, one cycle every two months, um, and uh, you know. So, so hopefully that um, for another trial for another clinical. Well, trial? For, yeah, a much larger trial. Yeah. Is this but, something that um, it, c it can be available to physicians that are treating people with multiple sclerosis or oncologists that are treating cancer patients? Because you've kind of you've shown. You know, you've shown that this is a very powerful metabolic therapy that can be used to, honestly, it seems like if, if we're talking about getting rid of damaged cells and replacing them with the new fully functional ones, it can be applied to a lot of diseases. Yeah, there is no doubt. Yeah. So we're now doing mouse work in many autoimmune diseases. For example, we're doing in cognitive uh, diseases. Um, so, um, yes, I think that... Um, what we're saying now to uh, clinicians is the following, and to patients is the following. And sometimes we get attacked for this, but, but I really feel that this is the way to uh, do it, which is um, if you feel, if there is a treatment, whether it's multiple sclerosis or another autoimmunity, um, or a degenerative disease or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, I mean, all these things we tested in some way in clinically. Uh, but, but if you can wait, because there's something that works already very well for you, then wait, right? You shouldn't try something. This is not fully tested, meaning that we don't have a, yes, this works. You only get that when you do 2,000 patients, or you know, I say at least 1,000, right? Um, and then you have to look at the statistics, you have to look at the response, et cetera, et cetera. We're not there yet, so we're saying, if you can wait, wait. Uh, if you cannot wait, because you, know, you have multiple sclerosis and you cannot take it anymore, or you have uh, cancer and you're stage four, or even you're stage one and you're getting devastated by the side effects. So go to your oncologist, your cardiologist, your diabetologist, your Im immunologist, whatever, and say, I can't take this anymore. This is not working. And of course, there's gotta be a decision made by the, the clinicians together with the patient saying, you know, should we take a risk uh, in, in, a, uh, you know, in adding to this fasting mimicking diet uh, to the treatment, and and that's you know together they have to come up with an answer. Uh, is it, is it worth the risk? And uh, to some people it is. You know we've had uh, some some people with Crohn's disease. Um, they said you know I can't wait anymore, and they did it and they did extremely well. You know uh, after the fasting making diet. You know so we we haven't published that yet, but uh, um, uh, and so I think same for multiple sclerosis and all these diseases. You have to see where you at. Can you wait? Can you not? Is there something that is working and they make the decision on uh, is it for now or is it for you know, five years from now? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, Walter. I want to kind of go back to this thought that you instigated in my mind when you're talking about this sort of like wound healing sort of analogy. And that is, um, at least with the hematopoietic stem cells, like I'm not sure about with you know, other stem cells and other tissues, but I know that they, when they're quiescent, when they're not dividing, um, they are glycolytic, meaning they use, they use glucose for energy because they don't want to damage themselves with 
reactive oxygen species being generated from, you know, as a byproduct of mitochondrial function, right? Uh, but I do know that um, when they come out of quiescence and they come out to either self-renew or differentiate into progenitor cells, they become ox oxidative phosphorylation becomes their source of mm -hmm. um, making energy. And so I'm wondering if there's, what the signal, I know you've published um, some studies on looking at different signaling pathways that are required to cause this um, hematopoietic stem cell self-renewal mechanism, but I'm wondering if possibly just not having the glucose available and having just the you know, fatty acids, the source um, of energy that can only be used by mitochondria, if that somehow also is playing a role in making them self-renew more or differentiate more? I think so, and this is the work by David Sabatini and others at MIT, um, and they're doing work on the fat and the role of fat and fatty acids, et cetera, on, uh, on self-renewal and, um, and on the activation of stem cells, particularly in the gut. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, there is, seems to uh, be a role for, for fat in, um, in, in that, and I think it's still... Uh, we're still beginning to understand uh, understand it. Um, I think obviously, with fasting, you produce fat, and you produce fatty acids and, and glycerol and and um, uh, ketone bodies. So the environment is there, and and uh, you know we um, we need to maybe understand more how each component that is changing mm -hmm. is affecting the program. Um, so yeah, so we we made the decision to try to, I think things are going very slow and we've always been very interested in people that have a problem now, right? Instead of, right. you know, <laughs> a lot of people are like, well, you know, in 20 years we'll have this. And we always say, you know, there's people that have cancer now, they have multiple sclerosis now, so what do you do for them, right? And uh, so our decision is, has been always uh, understand enough the mechanisms to be able to not, or minimize the chance of making mistakes. Um, Get to the disease, get to the clinical trial, and then go back and fill it in, right? Mm -hmm. Rather yeah, than yeah. rather than step by step by right. step by step, you know, and then it'll take you 15 years to get right. to the clinical trial. So yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm not criticizing the other method, but I'm just saying that that for us has been uh, get the mechanism, get enough mechanism, move to the clinical trial, um, and then make sure it's safe. And it's been fantastic. I mean, you've been able to translate so many different studies. I mean, it's really quite phenomenal. I'm just sort of thinking, in fact, I just thought about it when you were mentioning the ketone bodies too. Well, ketone bodies are, are a more, if you think about the stem cells and if, if they need energy to differentiate or self-renew, ketone bodies would actually provide, provide a very uh, energetically favorable source because it takes less, en less oxygen actually uh, to, to convert um, beta-hydroxybutyrate into acetyl-CoA as opposed to glucose into pyruvate. So if you think about it, it's more energetically favorable to, um, to have ketone bodies. And so maybe it also helps just because there's, it takes less energy to, to do this process. I mean, you know, it's possible, but. Yeah, I know. think it's also, there's also mechanisms. Uh, again, the, the fasting um, imposes this new metabolic yeah. um, profile and the new metabolic profile requires the um, stem cells uh, mm -hmm. for this regeneration that I mentioned. So if you, if you gotta get rid of health of your liver, let's say that you fast for a month and a half, right? Um, then you must, um, pro you will produce tons of fatty acids and tons of ketone bodies, and that environment is gonna require uh, the stem cells to be uh, renewing and being standing by for the day where you need to make a new liver, mm -hmm. essentially, or half of the liver, right? So this is why I think it's all a part of a, um, a coordinated response uh, where you, know, you have the fat, and, and, and by then, the fat is one of the few sources, abundant sources of energy also for the stem cells. So they really have no choice but to, uh, to be ready to respond to fat metabolites mm -hmm. Uh, so that they can uh, self-renew because there's not much sugar around and the brain needs the sugar, right. by the way, right? So the brain needs a lot of the sugar that is available. Ma a lot of it is made by gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes sense. Red blood sense. cells need it. 
yeah. since they have no mitochondria. Right, and and the, and so it makes sense that you will have a um, a, a system like that uh, yeah. that is fat fat and fatty acid and, and keto based. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, not to mention that, like you know, beta hydroxybutyrate's been identified to uh, be a signaling molecule as well. I think Eric Verdeen's work at UCSF showed it's a class one histone deacetylase inhibitor. I mean, who knows what's going on? But I wanted to yeah, ask you about um, back to the cancer and you know this fasting cancer, fasting medic diet and cancer. Um, a couple of things. So one is, you know, I th I think you've shown without a doubt that this that in both animals and also in some preliminary work in humans that the fasting or the fasting mimetic diet can sensitize cancer cells to standard of care, whether that's chemo, radiation, whatever, you know, d death. Um, while still protecting the normal cells, which are upregulating all sorts of protective pathways, as you mentioned. But there's this whole other field um, that I'm familiar with, and I'm sure you're familiar with, and that is that cancer cells also upregulate a lot of genes that are involved in autophagy, and they use this as a mechanism to um, help them spread, metastasize. Uh, I know that you know there, there's a very well-known inhibitor of autophagy called chloroquinone, which is used to you know, kill cancer. So, what do you what do you think? I mean, I you know obviously fasting is way. It's not just causing autophagy. It's like doing it's it's this whole like you mentioned. There's lots of uh, the sensitizing the cancer cells and the stress response, but all these different things going on, uh, causing the mitochondria to make more reactive oxygen species and all that. Do you think there's some sort of like um, different stage of cancer where this is, you know, autophagy becomes more important, like later in cancer when it actually, that's when the metastasis occurs, or what do you think of that whole field of, you know, autophagy also playing a role in cancer? I think uh, the autophagy, and I think this was in, uh, um, in the paper that was published together with ours um, by um, uh, Guido Cromer. Mm -hmm, Guido Cromer. And, uh, and he showed, and, and um, uh, Frank Madeo has also been doing work on that, but Guido was showing that autophagy was very, very important during the starvation or using starvation mimicking drugs in causing the um, exposure of the cancer cells to the immune system, right? So which probably means that, um, that autophagy is really part of this weakening and, and maybe death of the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. Um, so autophagy turns from something good uh, in a normal cell that it does it in a very coordinated way into something bad in a cancer cell, um, probably because it might break down components that are needed. I mean, I don't know, but, yeah. but certainly, um, you know, autophagy seems to be, um, you know, at least for, for this uh, purpose, it seems to be very important. And, um, and, uh, and probably uh, w um, the desperate part of the desperate attempt of cancer cells mm -hmm. to get what they need from somewhere, and uh, and that's what we see that in general we've seen that for almost everything else. Where, I mean, even independently of autophagy, the desperation seems to be key. Meaning that, for example, they try to increase translation uh, to get more proteins, right? Instead of shutting down like a normal cell would, they go and try to do things that. Um, they seem to be desperate, and of course, uh, you can't do that, and, and or you can do it only for so long, mm -hmm. and that's probably why they die. Yeah, I mean, it's. I know it was something that kind of was confusing to me at first, and then I thought about it for you know a, a little more in depth, and, and I thought, well, you know, fasting itself is doing so much more than just autophagy as well, so it's it's not like. You know, that's the only mechanism that you know. It's not that that's a current a biological mechanism that's changing with fasting. So, uh, but I just thought it was kind of interesting how it seems to be there's sort of this opposite end of the spectrum, you know, effects in terms of cancer. But you mentioned fasting, fasting mimetic drugs, or uh, what was it? fasting mimetic drugs or autophagy mimetic? Uh, no, f with fasting uh, mimicking drugs. Uh, so the Cromer uh, had a, a series of drugs. So which that... one? Like, is there? Uh, I forget now what drugs they, they had, but for mm -hmm. example, resveratrol is um, spermidine uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are considered uh, fasting mimicking drugs. Um, they, you know, they may not have the power of fasting, but certainly they push the cells in that direction. 
Uh, they they activate be certain signaling pathways that, similar, are, that are similar to fasting. And, and uh, you know, this is one of the discussions with people that do drugs. I mean, we, um, yeah, yeah you, you have some benefits, but of course you have also potential side effects, and usually the benefits are weaker than the ones that you get by right. doing the, the real thing. But that, that's okay. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reasonable compromise. If you can get some effects, let's say, by giving spermidine to, to cells and organisms, um, and uh, that makes life much easier than uh, having to uh, fast all the time. So, so I think you know maybe a combination of the of the uh, pharmaceutical intervention. Once we know that they're very safe and they're very effective, together with this older type of intervention, might be the way to go. You know, but we have to be very careful um, because again, in the future, and this I think has been under underestimated by the aging uh, community, which is uh, to treat somebody sick, um, you can allow a certain degree of toxicity by wh whatever treatment you're giving. But when you treat somebody healthy, really, there should be no toxicity whatsoever, right? Yeah. Because now you just generate, even if it was 1% of the people, they get a side effect. Uh, so in moving forward, forward with these fasting mimicking diets and these anti-aging drugs. I mean, we work on it ourselves, right? But, but certainly, you, have, you really got to get to the point where you say, I know this will never be toxic to anybody. It's tough, right? Right, it it's is, especially in long term. You're thinking, well, yeah. feedback loops, all sorts of things happen. If you're perturbing one system, that's going to have so many consequences. Because yeah. Everything's connected, you know, and how are you going to know 20 years from now? Yeah, exactly. That? Yeah, it's, impossible, it's impossible, right? So you love to you love to have the twenty years, right? Right. Yeah. You love to have the twenty years observation. And for example, this is why metformin now is starting to very slowly move into the candidate position for an anti-aging mm -hmm. drug. You know, near Barzilai and others are, are talking to the FDA about moving forward with it uh, because there is so much observation. But that doesn't mean that even for metformin, where all the observation is for diabetic patients. And given to somebody that is completely healthy, right. that may not be, turn out to be say to to generate some problems that we did not see in the right. diabetic population. Yeah, is, so metformin, in a way, sort of could you, one could possibly say, in a way, it's a uh, fasting mimetic in the sense where it activates AMP kind one of the signaling pathways that also oh, no is doubt, activating. Yeah. Yeah. Does it? Do you know if metformin increases autophagy, or has that been looked at? Uh, I'm pretty sure it does. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure it does. So. Huh. Metformin seems to, in our view, seems to be acting more in the sugar pathway, um, and then, but then, of course, it's missing the, the effect on the amino acid pathway, right. uh, or it has a much weaker effect on that pathway. So, but yeah, metformin's got potential. But then again, um, will I take metformin knowing what I know? Absolutely not. You know, <laughs> uh, will I? What take... about when you're 65 or 70? Would you start no taking way. it? No, really. No. Way. Why is that? Well, because. Um, it is, I, I just don't like the, um, I, I, you know, our laboratory discovered the Taurus cyscanase pathway in aging 15 years ago. And uh, we used to work with rapamycin back in the 90s, in the mid 90s, you know, we, we were working with the cells from, from Mike Hall. But I always said, I never want to work, I mean, not never, but I, I really am not enthusiastic working by in blocking something so central you know, in, the, in, in, a, in a cell and its metabolism and its growth, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think everybody got very excited in the field and you started seeing first the, all the positive results with rapamycin until, of course, you started getting the negative right. results, right? <laughs> and, and it was hyperglycemia, testicular degeneration, cataracts, and, and these are probably just some. And I think with any drug that intervenes as such a central inside of the cell. I always say that it's kind of like taking a car that has got a problem and just sticking things into it until you find, oh, the problem stopped, right? It's like, leave the, leave the knife in there, you know, or leave the, the device in there. You know, that's not the way you do it, right? You, you have to somehow rebuild the car in a way that, that uh, works. But pharmacology a lot of times, or almost always, blocks something. Right. right. It's like, well, when you block that, what happens to everything right. else around it? Well, I don't know. But, well, it's like, you know, 30 years <laughs> of all that, let's say, say you, you, you activate the AMP kinase, right? Yeah. And then you change all these things. Well, what happens after 30 years right. of this interference? And then you do it in all the cells. Is it possible that this just disruption of all these normal uh, uh, pathways it does nothing? I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, so we prefer, for example, we always prefer to go with where we have human evidence, then there are no consequences, and that's a growth hormone receptor, right? Mm -hmm. So we're now developing drugs against the growth hormone receptor. Why? Because we have the Ecuadorians that we've been following for, for 10 years, and uh, Guevara, has been, our colleagues, has been following them for, for 30 years, and they're fine. They make it to very old age. They're Can you explain that? So people like, you know, I don't know, the IGF-1 and growth hormone pathway. And right, right. So essentially, essentially um, amino acids, proteins and amino acids control two major pathways, right? One is the growth hormone IGF-1, which is called an axis. It's not really a pathway, but an axis. And then the other one is Taurus kinase, right? So if you have a lot of amino acids, that's, those two are, up, are activated. And both are now widely recognized as very powerful pro-aging uh, pathways. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so the, 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 if you, of course, you could do it by food or you could do it by mutation. So if you take a mouse and you knock out the growth hormone receptor, this mouse will live 40, 50 percent longer. It's uh, also, in spite, and this is work by John Kapchik and Andre Barkey, and in spite of living longer, um, it, it has much less diseases. So almost half of these mice will get to the end of life with no diseases that are visible, right? So it's really remarkable. And as remarkable, I think, is our work with humans that have the same mutation, the growth hormone receptor. And these people will live maybe a little bit longer, not 40% not longer for sure, um, but they, they have a terrible diet, they smoke, they drink, they really don't watch anything they do. And, um, and in spite of all this, um, they never get, almost never get cancer, they almost never get diabetes. We really haven't seen any chronic disease in these people. In the same households, they get normal diseases, right? So, so it has nothing to do with Ecuador, it has to do with the mutation, mm -hmm. which matches very well the, the mouse uh, data. But um, so, yeah, I, I think that, um, that uh, that is a much better target. I mean, I'm biased, but, but I think having all of it available to us uh, for a long time, and we, 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 picked the, we picked the target that was the least likely to cause any side effects, yeah. uh, also based on, on you know, very long-term human data. There's also human uh, data showing that there's polymorphisms in, for example, the IGF-1 receptor, uh, or that whole pathway, you know, that are also consistent with longevity as well. Right, right yeah. So, yeah, FOXO, there are FOXO, mutations and polymorphisms exactly. in FOXO in the IGF-1 receptor, in the growth hormone receptor. Yeah. Right. So, so all, all those... It's all consistent where... I, I mean, think so, yeah. I remember, in fact, one of my first, exper my first experiments in biology... Um, was doing, you know, manipulating the IGF-1 signaling pathway in worms uh, in Andrew Dillon's lab at the Salk Institute. And I remember when I saw, you know, when you get rid of that pathway um, and in these worms, they live 100% longer. I mean, it was like amazing to yeah. me that you could change one genetic pathway and cause a worm to live like like 100% longer. I mean, that to right. me was yeah. mind-blowing. Like, how is that? And these, are, and these are genes that are conserved in humans, nonetheless. So it really makes you think, well, if this can happen to a worm, you know, what's going to, what can, what's the potential for humans? And we yeah. know centenarians have, like you said, foxes. So IGF-1, um, just for people, so that IGF-1 is a growth signaling pathway that, um, I don't, and maybe you can answer this question for me. Um, when I think about it for human aging, I always think about too much IGF-1 being, um, playing an important role in cancer, promoting cancer growth. Um, when, when, I'm study when I was studying it in the worms, it was more about not inhibiting this very important stress response pathway, the FOXO3 pathway, pathway, and how that's important for turning on all these genes that are involved in stem cell, making stem cells, and autophagy, and degrading proteins, and it's just like a master regulator of all these like, amazing genes that can help you if you smoke, or just help you deal with the stresses of aging in general. Um, for humans, do you think that, IGF, that lowering IGF-1 uh, is going to be have a more profound effect on human lifespan via like not getting cancer, or do you think the FOXO not inhibiting that FOXO3 pathway is just as important? Um, I probably um, it's um, very much connected, meaning that the aging uh, process is the driver for the cancer, uh, both at the level of a cancer cells and accumulation of mutation, but also at the level of the tissues uh, getting more inflammation be more permissive to the metastasis and also the level of the immunosenescence and the immune system getting weaker and uh, and and we know that if you if you have a, 
uh, immune deficient mouse, the cancer grows a lot faster. Right. So yeah, so then the, the aging process is really, uh, and I think most of us agree, the, the primary um, uh, driver of the, the age-related disease, which is cancer, and of course all the other age-related diseases. So yeah, so we always look in, in terms of uh, um, you know treat aging, and then the rest comes. Uh, now, of course, yeah, there are other things that might not be necessarily related to um, to aging. For example, if you have high IGF-1 in the moment where the cancer cell is generated, that cancer cell might still love to have a lot of IGF-1 because it helps it prevent right. apoptosis. And so, you know, there could be a dual yeah. role of the of some of these growth factors uh, in in making sure that the um, that the cancer becomes a metastatic cancer, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, some of it may, may be independent of the aging process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we should probably also mention the good parts of IGF-1. You know, IGF-1 plays an important role in uh, muscle growth, muscle repair, and also it crosses the blood-brain barrier and plays an important role along with brain-derived neurotrophic factor for growing new brain cells. Um, yeah, this is why I was saying the, the fasting and refeeding, right? So during the fasting, the IGF-1 goes down, uh, and so does Tor and that does everything else. But during the refeeding, IGF-1 goes up, mm -hmm. and IGF-1 is the driver of all this regeneration, and most likely, I mean, we haven't looked uh, in, in, in depth, but you know, other people have. And so almost in, in a lot of regenerative process, you see IGF-1 uh, being involved. You know, the, and this is why I was saying that color restriction uh, will have this chronic effect on lowering the, uh, factors, but never has the, the Part B, which is after you lower it, you have to rebuild it, and that's oh, why. That makes sense. And that's why I think it may be only half of the of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something else I, that was what comes to my mind as well is um, wanting the IGF one to go where it's supposed, instead of sitting around in your in your you know serum and you know in the bloodstream, but going to the muscle, going to the brain. And I know that it's been shown in humans that um, that uh, IGF, yeah, it's been shown in humans that ex acute exercise, I think it was aerobic, lowers serum IGF-1. And I think it's because it's going to the muscle, also to the brain, because in mice it's been shown that exercise causes IGF-1 um, to cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain. So that's another good reason to exercise is because now the IGF-1 that you have, you know, is going to the places where it's, you know, it should. Right, Maybe. Right, right, yeah. So exercise, obviously, um, is no doubt that it's very beneficial. And some of it may be related to the fasting, meaning that exercise is known to do damage uh, to the muscle, right? And uh, so that damage, and, the fall, and, and then it's known that after the damage, you get repair. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's also known that the repair is what builds the muscle, right? So, so uh, this may be maybe not as potent as the, um, as the fasting, but if you do it all the time, mm -hmm. it could be that you have all these, these small regenerative uh, processes occurring uh, every couple of days, if you exercise every couple of days, and then you know, eventually those could be cumulatively, it could be actually uh, yeah. very powerful. And uh, yeah, so. Particularly uh, in combination with the fasting too. I mean, if you're, if you're gonna eat your, your protein and activate IGF-1, then it's good to exercise to make sure it's going to the right place, right? And so it's, I think. Yeah, yeah, think. yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. And in, in the book that I wrote, I, I really talk about exercise um, and the need to exercise to, um, uh, to make sure that <clears throat> some of these uh, restrictions don't end up in loss of lean body mass uh, because the exercise, right. especially the weight training, is very important in, in sending the, the signals uh, to the muscle to yeah. uh, rebuild it. And this is really another very interesting thing about fasting, um, which is it, uh, it takes the, the, the energy from the, from the uh, visceral fat, uh, but it also takes energy from the muscle. But then, unlike other diets, it rebuilds the muscle. And so now, you really, in clinically, we see a specific loss of, of fat, only significant in the visceral area, and then no loss or very minimal loss of lean body mass, right? Because it, there is temporary loss, but then rebuilding, right? So it's really interesting. 
Oh, and this is why athletes are starting to get, become very interested in these fasting mimicking diets. Right. Because, yeah, this, I'm glad because, you brought this uh, up. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you know, uh, most of our diets will, will, will get rid of uh, water, muscle, and fat, right? Right. And, and, then, and you, want, you want to increase lean muscle mass and decrease fat mass. I yeah. mean, that's... Or, or at least leave it alone, leave alone the lean body mass right. and decrease the right. fat. Right. Now right. You have, you know, you're, you're switching to, to a state that um, is much more beneficial uh, to your per- athletic performance, yeah. Do you think, uh, or I don't know, have you looked at whether or not mit- mitophagy or um, plays a role in any of this? Because I know that if you're clearing away damaged mitochondria or you know, mit- mit- mitophagy or mitophagy, I don't know which one, I've heard both, but um, you're causing, once that happens, much like in the, in the whole cellular system, it causes my- mitochondrial biogenesis. Yeah. So I'm wondering. Uh, yeah, so we're looking at that right now, yeah. So oh, cool. that, that's, uh, that's our current project. and. Uh, We'll see what happens, but uh, yeah, we're uh, we're um, optimistic and see. great, very very cool. Um, so we talked about so much, Walter. Thank you so much for um, talking with us. So, with these fasting mimetic diets that you refer to, um, either for people that are you know doing this for you know disease treatment, or they want they want to talk about it with their clinician, their oncologist, their doctor, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you, these are available for people. Yes, so there's a company that I founded. Uh, it's called El Nutra, and, uh, and it's elnutra.com. Um, El and Nutra, like L L dash Nutra, yeah, N U T R A, and um, and they have uh, they produce uh, a, a product called Prolon, FMD, uh, and the product I think is on prolonfmd.com, um, and this is a fasting mimicking diet that is. Uh, being tested clinically, um, doctors are now prescribing it, and so you can contact El Nutra and um, and ask for it. I should say, for disclosure purposes, I don't receive any salary from the company. I don't receive consulting, and my shares are, will be donated to a foundation. So I absolutely uh, have, uh, you know, I, I just did it because uh, the um, basically the patients were asking, "What oh, wow. can we do instead of fasting?" Right. So, yeah. so I. So I, you're yeah. not benefiting monetarily. No, not at all. Yeah. In fact, through. I think I lose money sometimes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think. Uh, That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I think I, I, um, I. It was not a good position to be in to, to be uh, benefiting from things we're testing. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So the company does it though. It's it's. Uh, of course, I, I help them a lot in, in trying to get this out to patient, but also trying to get it as cheap as possible. Um, you know, so as effective as possible, as cheap as possible. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we're there and uh, hopefully soon enough we'll, we'll be there uh, all over the planet, yeah. And there's lots of information there like on the protocols and all that. Yeah, all, that. all the information. So people usually have to go to a doctor, just get clearance from the doctor that they don't have a disease or a problem that otherwise prevent them from doing it. And then they, they get assigned a nutritionist or a dietitian, um, and they just follow them for the, for the five days from the distance. You can do this at home. Um, yeah, and the great majority of people have no problem. Uh, but you just have to be a little bit careful. It is a powerful intervention. Yeah. And um, you have to respect it as such. So you know, people, diabetics, anorexic people, People, particularly with diseases, taking drugs, they have to really, uh, the doctor is the only person that can decide if somebody's taking drug, whether this can be combined with, right. uh, with the fasting mimicking diet. And um, yeah, so uh, there are some, some warnings, but uh, the, the, the company and the doctors will tell you about it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you click like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You should also head over to my website at foundmyfitness.com and sign up for my email newsletter. I send out interesting articles, links to studies, updates on upcoming videos, and so much more. Also, all of my videos are brought to you by the generous support of fans, much like you, supporting the channel. You can learn more about that at foundmyfitness.com forward slash crowdsponsor.